Thank you very much. You're ready. Um, welcome to the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh, everyone. My name is Mark Phillips. I'm the president. Uh, we've got a very exciting um, talk tonight, which I'm, I'm very excited about, so that's for sure. Um, but I'll go through a few slides, first of all, just to say what's happening and what's coming up for us soon. Um, that's the one way around. Um, coming soon, we have, um, on the 3rd of December, we have Will Joy uh, telling us about finding space rocks, finding meteorites. That's a hybrid meeting, so if you can make it in person to Edinburgh, then um, that would be great. Um, or you can watch it online on Zoom for members and YouTube. Uh, we have a regular monthly imaging and observing group um, on the 8th of December. On the 17th of December, the last talk of the year will be about Thomas Cook, the telescope maker uh, to the empire. And that's um, a virtual talk online. 7th of January, we'll have a talk about Neville Masculine from Rebecca Higgett. Um, 21st of January, building galaxies one star at a time from Dr. Elizabeth Stanway. And um, on the 4th of February, upgrading the 20-inch Grubb Parsons Telescope. That's at Glasgow University, I believe. And Professor Giles Hammond will be telling us about that. And on the 18th of February, a talk from Lynn Smith with the British Astronomical Association about the red sun, as she calls it. Um, as the previous slide said, there's a lot of information on our website, on Facebook, on Twitter, and all our previous meetings are also on uh, YouTube if you want to uh, keep up to date with what's happening uh, with us here. But I wouldn't slow us down anymore. Um, I'm going to hand over just now to David Levy about his talk about a night watchman's journey, the road not taken. Um, I should say um, this is um, very exciting for me because I'm a bit of a fan of David Levy. As I was growing up in my astronomical journey, David Levy was always a name. I think if I dig out all my old Sky and Telescope magazines, David Levy was probably in every single one of them. And the last time I checked on Wikipedia, he has um, seven, 76 discoveries. I don't know if that's correct, David. Maybe you can update us on that one. But um, it, it's, it's um, amazing to have the legend that is David Levy here. So um, I'm going to hang over to him. Um, I think David's talking to us. There aren't slides for this one. So I'm going to stop sharing and hand over to, to David. Over to you, David. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much, Mark. And I usually begin with this quote, hung be the heavens with black, yield day to night. Comets, importing changes in times and states, brandish your crystal tresses in the sky. But I'm not going to begin with that quote from Henry VI, part one tonight, because just a few hours ago, we had an absolutely wonderful eclipse of the moon. It wasn't total, but it was, it was deeply partial, like 97%. And the dark part of the moon was quite dark. I'm wondering if that's because of dust in the Earth's atmosphere, because of the... Uh, volcano eruption that's that's been going on, although I don't know if that's it, but it was a pretty, it was a nice dark eclipse and uh, looking forward to two more in the new year. But the quotation I'm going to begin with instead is uh, to honor a lecture I heard at this organization a few months ago about Thomas Hardy. I really did enjoy that and I'm going to, I'm doing a quote from Thomas Hardy's poem at a lunar eclipse. Apparently he did see one from London in 1902, and he wrote this in 1903. Thy shadow earth from pole to central sea now steals along the moon's meek shine in even monochrome and curving line of imperturbable serenity. How shall I link such sun-cast symmetry with the torn troubled form I know as thine? that profile placid as a brow divine with continents of moil and misery. And can immense mortality but throw so small a shade and heaven's high human scheme be hemmed within the coasts yon arc implies? Is such a stellar gauge of earthly show, nation at war with nation, brains that teem, heroes and women fairer than the skies. It was a lovely eclipse, but I'm now enjoying 
so much being with with you. Uh, I've not, haven't been in London for several years now. The last I was here was to look through uh, the uh, telescope, the um, Leviathan of Parsonstown, north of you in Ireland. And while I was getting ready for a uh, to catch a train to go a little bit north of of you, I went to the station, of course, to catch the train, and uh, I was noticed that there were all the tracks one through nine and then at the end they had track nine and three quarters <laughs> and uh, that was the train to hogwarts i very nearly got on that one but at the last minute i decided i better go where i'm supposed to go anyway my presentation today my lecture today has to do with um my passion and my love my deep love for astronomy and it started very suddenly when I was eight years old. I was at a summer camp at, uh, in Vermont, the state of Vermont, the Green Mountain State. In 1956, the sky that night was very clear. Of course, I was too young to notice it, so was everybody else. We were all watching firework displays to celebrate Independence Day. Being born in Canada, I didn't know from Independence Day, and I had no idea what was going on. And they sent us little kids back home pretty quickly after the fireworks ended. And we were walking up a we were walking up a a low hill to our cabin when I looked up at the sky and I saw a shooting star. It was not very bright. It was certainly visible traveling from towards from the area near Vega down towards down into uh, actually it was traveling from Draco towards Vega in the uh, east it was rising in the east that time at that time and I looked at the other people in the in our group and I said did any of you see that shooting star just now and they looked back and they said no none of them have. And there was a thought that entered my little eight-year-old David brain that said, was that shooting star meant just for me? Yeah. Anyway, I did not begin my love of astronomy that night, but I put it into my mind and waited for, uh, waited for a little while later, a few years took place. A few months after that, uh, we were thinking about the uh, first Russian satellite Sputnik 1 that was hurled into orbit. And then in 1960, after a broken arm, a cousin of mine gave me a book about the night sky. And I started looking at that book. I read it, read it again, again, and again. And uh, I was hooked. I remember my talking about nothing but astronomy all that summer. And dad telling me one night at dinner, David, it's, I appreciate your interest in the night sky, but really you have to keep your head in the clouds, clouds but your feet on the ground. And uh, so it's okay to talk about astronomy sometime, but not all the time. Please do not make astronomy the most important thing in your life. And I remember thinking, okay, dad, I won't make it the most important thing in my life. I'll make it the only thing in my life. And unfortunately, or fortunately, that's what has happened since then. On September the 1st, 1960, a car pulled up to our house. It was my uncle, and he took out a very long box. And he explained to us that he had bought this telescope for his children, but his children showed no interest to, into it. So he's going to give it to me as a early bar mitzvah present. I opened it up and out came Echo, a three and a half inch telescope. That very night was clear. I set it up and I looked at the brightest thing in the sky, which it turned out was Jupiter. It looked like a donut with a hole in the middle of it. And that is, is definitely not the way to look for a telescope. I then realized that if I push the eyepiece in a little bit, 
the donut got a little bit smaller. And I pushed in a little more, a little more, and suddenly the donut revealed itself to be Jupiter. It was unforgettable. I have never forgotten that view. It was my first view of anything for a telescope. And that was something I will never forget. Mom and dad were out there and I had them both look at it. They were pretty exciting, excited too. But then I noticed four little stars around and dad said, those are the moons of Jupiter. And I swear, Galileo himself could have felt no greater thrill than I did that night when I made my own independent discovery, personal discovery of the moons of Jupiter. Something that I wrote years later, our fondness for the stars has touched our souls. We all share the feeling of discovery, whether the object we have found is new to all or new only to us. The thrill penetrates our being as we try to describe how we have been changed by the universe sharing a secret with us. And on that night, I think the solar system shared a secret with me. I saw Jupiter and its moons. And what I didn't see that night was a comet that happened to be in the field of view very close to Jupiter. That comet was too faint to be discovered by anybody that night. It was orbiting Jupiter, which itself was unusual. And uh, on that, that time in 1960, it was making a pretty close approach. It moved away from Jupiter after that, moved about as far from Jupiter as Mercury is from the sun, but then started going back again. Two year, every two years, it would make a fairly close approach to Jupiter. In 1993, in 1992 actually, it made a very close approach to Jupiter, so close that it brushed Jupiter's cloud tops and broke apart into multiple pieces. A few months later on the 23rd of March, 1993, I was observing at Palomar Observatory, home of the wondrous 200 inch Hale telescope, but also home of our favorite telescope, an 18 inch diameter Schmidt camera. And we were observing that night and uh, turned out we were using films, taking exposures. When I was with Jean and Carolyn Shoemaker, both passed on now, sadly. But we had started observing when Jean interrupted us and told us that he had developed a couple of the first films and the films were completely, absolutely black. There was nothing on them at all. We stopped observing. And it turned out that somebody else who's using our same telescope opened our box of film, looked inside and said, oh, there are unexposed films in here. And they are being exposed to light. Do you think we should close this uh, box quite, quite quickly? And the others in the group said, yes we should think about closing the box quite quickly. And they closed the box and ruined the films in the box. <laughs> as, we were, as, as we were wondering about that, as we were, uh, we were thinking about it, uh, one of us thought, what about looking at some of the films at the very bottom of the stack? They may have been protected by the upper films in the stack. And we tried, Gene just took one and developed it and it seemed clear, except for a dark spot at the edge. We were able to continue observing that night with those bad films. The next night <clears throat> was the 23rd of March. This was, I believe, the 22nd. On the 23rd, we started observing by now we had properly prepared films. Everything was fine, except it started to cloud over after about an hour. We stopped observing, went outside, 
and we looked up at the cloud and clouds increasing over over the Palomar sky. As we were looking, I noticed that there were still holes in the sky. And I told the others, you know, there are some breaks. We could shoot through those breaks. And Gene laughed and he said, that's our David, always the optimist. And he said, David, every time we slap a film into that telescope, it costs us $4. We cannot simply afford to be observing when the sky is this bad. And I looked at Gene and I said, well, $4 isn't too bad. And Gene snapped back at me. That's four Canadian dollars, David, not four American dollars, David, not that Canadian stuff you guys spend, not that Monopoly money you spend. And we had a good laugh. We were about to walk inside when Carolyn said, you know, Gene, the sky is starting to clear a little bit. And we looked around, Carolyn looked at Gene, Gene looked at me, I looked at the sky again, and Gene said, let's do it. And what we did was we took some of the bad films from the night before, and we put them in the telescope. We put one of them in the telescope. The very next picture I took turned out to be the very first of the two discovery pictures of Comet Shoemaker Levy 9. We didn't know it at the time, after we took that picture and a couple of others, the sky clouded over again. We had to wait over an hour before it cleared enough to take the second set of those films. And we now fast forward two days till the 25th of March. Carolyn was looking through her, telescope, looking through her stereo microscope and we're trying to find that, if I might digress for a second, we were trying to find that for a exhibition that's being planned in Flagstaff for an early or for May of next year. If we could find the stereo microscope, we could actually put the two discovery films of SL9 in it, and that would be the centerpiece of the exhibit. But at the moment, we have not found it. But uh, we'll have to see. Anyway, we're looking where Carolyn, I was looking, uh, I, I was uh, reading my email, I suspect. Carolyn was scanning films and Jean was reading Time Magazine on this cloudy afternoon. When suddenly Carolyn stopped scanning, she looked, looked at us and then she said, I do not know what I have, but it looks like a squashed comet. And Gene needed to stand up and because none of us had ever seen a squashed comet before. But Gene looked and I looked at Gene and Gene looked at me with a look I have never seen on his face before of absolute puzzlement. We, we, we looked at, I, I decided I needed to take a look at it. And it looked like this train of fuzzy cometary light stretching through the, the uh, across part of the film with a very thin bar of light on either side of the train and five or six tails going up. I'd never seen something like that before. The other interesting thing is that because we were using stereoscopic images, I was looking at two images at once. And so the moving comet appeared to float above the background of stars. Well, we had a comet, but it was so unusual, we really did not know what to do with it. But we had to report it, which we did, and then we needed to get confirmation. I had a, I have a close friend, Jim Scotty, who was observing that very night here in Arizona at Kid Peak Observatory. I gave him a call, told him about our find, and he said, well, I don't know. I have a lot of work to do tonight, but I'll see what I can do. Meantime, we made precise positions of the image, of the cometary image, and about an hour and a half later, 
I telephoned Jim back. And I'll never forget the way that he answered the phone. It was like with a bit of a clunk. And I said, Jim, is that you? And he said, uh-huh. And I said, are you okay? And he said, David, the sound you just heard is me trying to pick my jaw off the floor. And I said, Jim, do we have a comet? He said, boy, do you three ever have a comet? It is the most unusual commentary foreign I've ever seen in my life. And I said, I tried to thank him for taking time to look at it. And he said, David, you don't get it. He said, I will be spending the rest of the night imaging this comet. I'm forgetting about our program. And it turned out that he spent the rest of that observing session for the rest, next several days imaging the comet and much of the next year as the comet told its story. Uh, two months later, we were back at the observatory now under very clear sky and uh, Carolyn was scanning, Jean was loading film for the night's observing and I was reading my email. I looked at the email, there were two, two messages from the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams. And one of those messages talked about Shoemaker Levy 9. And uh, it was interesting because he, he wanted to know, uh, I had asked him years earlier, how would you report if you had discovered, if someone had discovered and reported an asteroid or a comet that was going to collide with the Earth. And Brian Marsden said, easy. I would simply provide the predicted positions of the comet from the ephemeris. One of the things in that ephemeris is a delta, which is distance between the comet and the Earth. And anyone reading the ephemeris can see delta decreasing until delta would be less than the radius of the Earth. And then you'd know that there would be an impact. And that's precisely what he did. There was a delta J factor in this ephemeris, which was the distance between the comet and the center of Jupiter. And as you went down, you could see delta J getting slow, smaller and smaller until it was less than the uh, radius of Jupiter. But there was a second, there was a second circular that came out at the same time, which I then read. And he explained as, as those of you who have checked the ephemeris now realize the comet will on July 16th approach Jupiter to much less than the radius of Jupiter and that there will be a collision of at least some of the fragments of the comet with Jupiter. And he estimated in that circular a 65% probability that some of the uh, parts of this comet, shoemaker levy none would collide with Jupiter. A few days later, Jet Propulsion Lab came up with a revised prediction that there was a better than 90% chance that all of the fragments of the comet would collide with Jupiter. And that turned out to be correct. From July 16th to July the 21st of 1994. It was something special. It was one of these events that happened in life that one does not expect. And of course, the uh, famous quotation, chance favors the prepared mind. Uh, we were not really as prepared as we would have liked to be for the news. But I read this and I said, Carolyn, our comet is going to collide with Jupiter next July, July of 1994. And Carolyn's reaction was she looked at me and said, we're going to lose our comet. Gene was still in the dark room. He heard what the conversation and he said, what did you just say? And I said, our comet is going to collide with Jupiter. And his next words were, stop what you're doing. 
do not move. I need to see this. And he quickly put everything away so that it was protected, thrust the door of the dark room open, rushed to where I was and read the message. And I've never seen Gene cry, but I think I did that day. He looked and he said, in our lifetimes, in my lifetime, we're going to see a comet collide with a planet. I just don't believe that. And uh, the three of us had a chance to read this. And the rest of that day, there was actually very little conversation going on among the three of us. We were trying to understand what was going to happen. And uh, as news spread around the world about this collision, it grasped the astronomy community and the wider community that there was going to be an event in the solar system that we're all going to be able to see. And listening to news in the United States about it, of course, a lot of it was negative. You won't see anything. You won't see a single thing. Early in 1994, Gene asked me where I was planning to be during the collisions. And I said, I would like to be here in California where the sky is expected to be clear as it usually is in the summer times so I could see the impacts. And where are you gonna be? And he said, Carolyn and I will be in Washington uh, at the time. Where are you gonna be? And I repeated my answer, getting a little bit aggravated now because he kept on asking that. And then I asked Gene again, where are you gonna be? And he said, we'll be in Washington. Where are you going to be? This was the third time he asked that question. I looked at Gene and I said, I think I should like to be in Washington with the two of you. <laughs> and he looked at me, clapped his hands and he said, that's the answer I needed to hear. This will be the most important moment of our lives. We need to be here and we need to be together. So if we don't see anything, we'll all find a rock we can crawl under somewhere. The night before the impacts, uh, there was an article, I think it was in Science, and it said that beware, the great fizzle is coming. We're not gonna see anything. The impacts of such a small comet against such a large planet are not going to be visible. The next day, July 16th, we were preparing for our first press conference. We're all sitting down. They were telling us how to sit, sit properly with our jackets behind us and to, to be ready for whatever happened or didn't happen. And uh, while, we were, while we were preparing like this, one of the scientists rushed in with a piece of paper. He came down the stairs and he silently put the paper in front of Gene. Gene looked at it and he looked and he stood up. He said, you mean they saw plumes? Boy, did that interrupt that preparation for our press conference. We rushed in to read, the, uh, to read all of the other news. And by now there were messages coming from all over the world, from Europe, from Antarctica, not yet from the United States, but messages from everywhere talking about giant plumes being visible on the face of Jupiter. That night, the, <clears throat> that we were able to see soon afterwards beautiful images from the Hubble Space Telescope that you have all seen by now showing this lovely, lovely plume and the remains of it as it landed again on the top, on the tops of the clouds of Jupiter. During the press conference, we were all explaining how we got together, how we started observing and the discovery that I've just explained to you. <clears throat> Someone from the, uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope in the same building, Heidi Hamill, walked in, interrupted the press conference, took the microphone, 
and said, Gene Shoemaker said that we're all not going to be surprised by what we see. And Gene, I'm happy to tell you, we are not going to be surprised. The Hubble Space Telescope got a beautiful image of both the impact on the limb of Jupiter and the plume that can be seen on the face of the planet. By this time, people were seeing it with small telescopes. And the next day on the 17th of June, there were other impacts. On the 18th of June, the largest fragment, the fragment called G, collided with Jupiter and it left a, a mark on Jupiter larger than the Earth. It was beautiful. It was wondrous. And that day and the rest of that week, there were press conferences every day. Some of them, Gene and Carolyn were attending, others I was attending. On the 20th of July was one that I was attending. And as the conference began, there was a, uh, the door opened and Gene walked in and he beckoned to me to come to him. And I looked, I looked at the, I looked at the lady sitting next to me and I said, nothing is going to take me away from this press conference. And she looked back at me and nodded in agreement. And I looked at, uh, I, I, I looked towards Gene and I said, I have to stay here. And he came up to me and he said, we've been invited to the White House. You need to leave now. I looked at the lady sitting next to me and I said, accept that. <laughs> and I left. There was a ceremony at the White House that we attended. It was actually for the, for the anniversary of the 25th at the time of the Apollo 11 moon landing. And uh, they had a lecture at the White House given by Neil Armstrong. And he said, our old astrogeology mentor, Gene Shoemaker, even called in one of his comments to mark the occasion with spectacular Jovian fireworks. It was really very interesting to hear that. After that was over, we got to meet President, then President Bill Clinton. And later on, we had a good conversation with Vice President Al Gore, who obviously has a, had and has a lively interest in astronomy. It was a wonderful week. It was incredible. It was beautiful. And it was something that we will never forget. And I will say now it was the second most transformative week in my life. And you're asking, well, what was the first most transformative week? And that was the week that I married Wendy. And that, that was the most important week of my life. But in my career, the, um, the story of Shoemaker Levy 9 that I've just told you was the most important thing. That was half of my career. I'd like to touch briefly on the sec other half, which began when my father and I were talking and dad told me that I really would like you to get an interest in Shakespeare. And I really thought that dad was threatening me in a way that if I did not inherit his love of Shakespeare, he would actually disinherit me. Of course, that wasn't true, of course, but, but, but I believe that he really wanted me to take an interest in Shakespeare. And so I did. I enjoyed reading Shakespeare in high school. I enjoyed studying him at university, except that as I'm reading things from plays like King Lear, I came across things like these late eclipses in the sun and moon pretend no good to us. These late eclipses in the sun and moon, like the one I saw just last night, pretend no good to us. And, uh, and I, enjoyed, I enjoy, enjoyed reading that, but I totally missed the fact that Shakespeare was writing about eclipses. I totally missed that Shakespeare was writing at the start of Henry VI 
one of his first plays about comets. And then I got into other plays, totally ignoring his interest in the night sky until I was looking at a meteor shower in 1976 and wondering, I wondered if any of these poets actually looked up at the night sky. And that got me into the night sky in English literature. I'm going to just share with you now a quotation from Shakespeare from Macbeth. <clears throat> and you, you know, we all know that Shakespeare really had a way with explaining and bringing us into the world of nature in a way that I don't think any other writer could do that with the possible exception of Gerard Manley Hopkins. <clears throat> he's writing Macbeth in 1605 or so, and he's thinking about how is he going to express Macbeth's emotion at the loss of his wife, Lady Macbeth. The queen, my lord, is dead. And he's trying to think of what he's going to write when there's a tap on his shoulder. And he turns around and there is God standing right behind him saying, Will, take a break, get yourself a cup of coffee. I've got this. And here are the words that he wrote after Shakespeare, after Macbeth is told that his wife has passed away. And if you could say that he is anticipating by three centuries or more, four centuries, the the general theory of relativity, the mixture of space and time, I believe that he is. And to emphasize the point, I'm adding one line to this quotation. She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in its petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time and then is heard no more. Out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing, signifying everything. And thus does Shakespeare go into the idea that space and time bring us out and we go outside and we look at the night sky and we, and it signifies in my view, everything. After that meteor shower, I visited the very next day, my thesis advisor, Norman McKenzie, and told him about my feeling from the night before about the night sky in English literature. He agreed with that, and he suggested that I become familiar with Gerard Manley Hopkins, who had an interest in the night sky. And he introduced me to, and those of us who have studied, I'm sure most of us here, have read Hopkins and really were annoyed with, at least one of us is raising his hand saying that he has, but we're really annoyed at the difficulty of reading Hopkins until we encounter a poem that he wrote when he was a student at Cambridge in 1864. I am like a slip of comet, scarce worth discovery, in some corner seen bridging the slender difference of two stars, come out of space or suddenly engendered by heady elements for no one. The truth knows. when the actual liner goes down on the but when she sights the sun, she grows and sizes and spins her skirts out while her central star shakes its cocooning mist. And so she comes to fields of light, millions of traveling rays pierce her. She hangs upon the flame case sun and sucks the light as full as Gideon's fleece. But then her tether calls her, she falls off. And as she dwindles, sheds her smock of joy amidst the sistering planets and then goes out into the cavernous dark. 
So I go out, my little sweet is done. I have drawn heat from this contagious sun to not ungentle death, now forth I run. Hopkins had a telescope. He enjoyed looking for telescopes and he enjoyed following comets. I often like to think of poets like Hopkins, even Shakespeare, and uh, one other that I will introduce in just a moment. I thought that he, I like to think that his first interest was in the night sky. He even thought he might have discovered a comet, which turned out to be instead the beehive star cluster. <clears throat> but there was one other poet and uh, Ralph Hodgson was his name. He wrote a very long poem that if I were to quote the entire thing to you right now, it would take several weeks. So I think I will just quote the final lines. And to help me with that, I'm going to bring Wendy out here, my wife, and she and I are gonna quote the final lines of the Song of Honor. And he is standing on top of a low hill, looking up at the night sky. And with this poem, I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to do it in a few minutes. I'm now going to try to show you before I quote that, a thing. I told a, uh, a video that I have prepared. Uh, brings me back to when I first started in astronomy. I was looking up at the night sky, looking at Jupiter and his four moons, and also seeing, not seeing actually, the comet that I would soon, that I would much later help to discover. And looking at dad and asking him to look through and saying, daddy, come look at the evening sky. This, this might work and it might work, it might not work, but I'm now going to try to share this with you. A pianist named Ken Miedema wrote this song, daddy, come look at the evening sky that I'm now going to try to share with you. And we'll take just a couple of minutes for me to bring this up. Uh, let's see, this, this, we share the screen. And uh, I'm going to share the sound as well. And uh, I think, are you able to see? We're seeing the sharing starting, yes. Okay, and now let's see if this is going to work. Oh, Daddy, come look at the evening sky. The edge of tomorrow's dawn. It's four billion years old. It's a mighty ship that goes sailing on and on. Daddy, come look at the evening sky for the wonders yet to come. And we'll follow the course of the great sailing ship till the ship comes sailing. Tomorrow's dawn It's four billion years old It's a mighty ship And it goes sailing on and on And Daddy, come look at the evening sky For the wonders yet to come And we'll follow the course Of that great sailing ship Till the ship comes sailing home. And I hope you were able to see that. <clears throat> yeah, that worked well. Thank you, David. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, and now we bring, so I often thought of Shoemaker Levy 9 as a sailing ship, not so much colliding with Jupiter, but coming home. 
And now, if Wendy could join me, I'd like to end with Ralph Hodgson's poem. Are you ready, sweetie? I'm ready. <laughs> okay, here we go. I stood and stared. The sky was lit. The sky was stars all over it. I stood. I knew not why. Without a wish, without a will, I stood upon that silent hill and stared into the sky until my eyes were blind with stars. And still I stared into the sky. Thank you all very much. Thank you, David. Can we all thank David for that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy, as well, for that. <laughs> Um, I, I, I was just watching the YouTube comments. There's, a, there's something that really um, appeals to me as well. It, it, this is like watching the historical equivalent of being able to listen to, to Edmund Halley. So there you go, David. <laughs> <laughs> I really liked. Um, have you got any questions for David? Oh, strange noises. Uh, there's one question from David, David Archibald. Do you want to ask your question or Just will I ask? Um, yes, that was a that was a very good talk. I just wondered you. if you'd if you'd actually thought about going to space or going to the ISS to actually fulfill a dream of actually being there and observing it rather than being on Earth. I don't think I've ever met. That's an excellent question, David. Thank you. And I do not believe I've ever met anyone any child who did not want to go to space. <laughs> However, when, last night when I went outside and I opened my observatory and I just looked up at the sky and saw that lunar eclipse, an event that tells me that the solar system doesn't just stand there, it happens. And I saw the wonderful shadow of the earth encounter the moon. I felt when I'm out there with my telescope and looking up at the sky, I feel as close to being in space as I ever need to be. But it's a good question, nevertheless. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Any more from the uh, Zoom contingent at the moment? I have a question, David. You must, you must have met quite a lot of famous astronomers over the years. Who, who's the most interesting or the, the, the greatest astronomer you've come across, you think? I have. That's also a good question. I've met many. Jean and Carolyn Shoemaker, two of my favorites, Bart Bach. I never got to meet Harlow Shapley, although I would have liked to have known him. But my favorite one has got to be Clyde Tombaugh. <laughs> and we got to be very close friends. I read about him when I, out of that book that I got with on my broken arm. And I always had a desire to meet him. First met him at a lecture I was giving in 1980, and he was in the audience. We got to be good friends. Towards the end of his life, as I was writing his biography, he was reminiscing many times about his discovery of Pluto. And he said that I know they're going to demote it. I can sense it, I can feel it. And it really, really bothered him that they were going to, that they were going to do that. I don't, I don't understand how he knew that, but he did. After Pluto was demoted to a dwarf planet status, uh, they asked his widow, Patsy, how she felt, and she explained, Clyde was a scientist. He would have accepted it. With all due respect and love to Patsy, I disagree. I think it would have, I think it would have eaten him up. And uh, it was nice to discuss over and over again at near the end of his life that thing. But I think that Clyde was probably the most interesting. The other one has got to be Wendy. And the reason is that Wendy, before I met her, had been known to observe eclipses, both of the sun and of the moon, and write about them in her journal. Uh, 
She asked me a question that meant a lot to me as we were starting to date. She said, she asked me to point out one of the stars, which I did, it was Vega. And she said, David, if I asked you every night to point out that star and tell me what star it is, what would be your reaction? And I looked at her and I said, I will point out Vega to you every night. And I will never, ever tire of doing that. And, but thank you for asking that question. Very good. There's a, a comment from a couple of folks about how the uh, breaking your arm can be a good thing then. It certainly was <laughs> in that regard. It, certain, it certainly was, and I've never forgotten that day. And it was the trigger that started my life in astronomy. And as I'm now much, much older than I was, I can still turn these wrists and find that this one does not turn as much as that one does as a result of that double break in the spring of 1960. On June 21st, 1960, actually the first day of the summer that started me off in astronomy. Mm -hmm. are, are you still hunting comets and asteroids, David? Is that something you still do? I mean, with, yes, with it is. automated methods, it must be quite hard to keep up with, with, with them. I cannot keep up with the automated methods, but I love doing it. I do it so often every night, and I'm still doing it. Uh, the I did for a while start a um, program with a CCD camera, but that's but the equipment isn't working so well. So I'm pretty much now back to visual comet hunting, and I still do, and I still love doing it. And I love also sharing the poetry that comes because to me, the night sky is poetry. It is a way of looking at the world, to looking at the big picture of the world, not just what you see on the nightly news, what you see and hear on the nightly news, but seeing everything that happens not in time scales of seconds or minutes, but in time scales of a billion years. And looking at the entire picture of the night sky gives me a perspective on the world that I think is unique. Yeah. Are there, are there any, any more questions before we, before we close? Is there any on YouTube, Will? Um, there's, there's not any questions, but everybody's enjoyed it. And there's been some, some very lovely comments uh, there. Um, excellent talk. I'm really glad they did. And thank you so much for inviting me to talk to the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh. Well, thank you very much. It was great to see you when, when Randall was giving his talk on Thomas Hardy as well. And it was really kind of you to give us a talk. So we, we've all really enjoyed it. So thank you very much, David. Can we thank David again? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>